Hello and welcome to this special bonus episode of The Dairy Edge. Chagas are running a weekly Let's Talk Dairy webinar series, which is also being made available as a podcast. On this week's webinar, Stuart Childs speaks to Marion Beecher and Nolik Heffernan about managing your time to maximum effect. Okay, welcome along everyone. Um, today we're going back to the labour series again and uh, again we're joined by Marion Beecher. Marion's getting worried that you're going to be getting overkill of her but I don't think you can. She's good information, new information again today and we're also joined again today now by Nolig Heffernan and the two uh, presentations that the ladies are going to do for us today are going to complement one another. So Marion is looking at the um, time that people spend uh, doing different tasks and so forth and how they, that can be manipulated in order to uh, maximize the use of your own time and how you'll use the time of others to help you get through the work. And then uh, Nolik is going to talk about how you have to be careful with your own time because there can be a lot of people who will take time from you and ultimately that can end up meaning that you're going to spend a lot uh, a lot of time working late into the evening to make up for time that someone else has taken from you. So, um, Marion, I'll ask you to start sharing there and you can start your presentation. So, as I said, Marion's going to talk about actually managing your own time and the, the whole concept of today is looking to man manage your own time to maximum effect. So, there's obviously the man that made time didn't make enough of it for a lot of us uh, and so it's trying to make the best use of all of the time that we have available during the course of the day. So, thanks, Marion. Perfect. Thanks, Stuart. Um, yeah, so it, Stuart, you kind of teed it up nicely. So I just kind of go in, go in and say, start off by looking at the proportion of work contributed to different sources on, on a dairy farm. Um, and as you said, like time is a finite resource and there's only so much of the time we have in a week. It doesn't change. We can't make more or less of it. So um, it's about making the best use of it. So this is a study, as I said, a time use study that we would have done last spring. So looking at the hours worked on the farm between February and June, we'd say on, on various size, different size farms. So the, the total number here on the top is the amount of time that was required to run the farm and um, for all the work that was required to be done on the farm between that February to June period. Um, and then down below is just the different people who are contributing to, um, to that workload. So we can see, in, you know, the farmer um, is contributing between like 57 and 61 hours per week. Um, but, you know, roughly regardless of what time, whatever herd size he's operating, it's, it's in around the, the 1300 um, hours per, um, for that, that February to June period. Um, and I suppose, look, as, as the herd size increases, you know, the proportion of work that the farmer is contributing and percentage wise is decreasing. So, but I suppose regardless, whoever, whatever herd size you're operating, there's still a requirement for other people to be on the farm. Um, and, you know, there's work that's contributed by family members in all cases, um, by, by hired staff, whether it's on a part-time or a full-time basis and contractors. So I suppose the message from here is that regardless of what herd size you're operating at, there's generally a, you know, there's a standard amount of time that the farmer is putting in and I suppose it's how best to use that time. And if we look at it on a work profile annually, so this is work that was done by Justine Deming um, in 2015-2016 um, and she was looking at farmers that were labour efficient, looking at farmers who had herds of sizes between less than um, 150 cows and up to 250 cows greater. So we can see, you know, regular starting time, finishing time, linked to the working day across the years between almost nine and ten and a half hours. Um, and then there's a certain amount of time, I suppose, that's that's taken up with breaks during the day. So I suppose if we look at the length of the working day, that's the, suppose, the amount of time that you have to play with during your day to, to, to get all your jobs done and, and to make best use out of that time. So you're looking um, for the efficient farmers between you know seven and eight hours um, of work during the day and I suppose it's how best to use those seven or eight hours per day to, to maximum to maximum effect. Um, and again overall this was the most efficient farms we're looking at you know spending between 40 to you know 55 hours per week um, on their farming workload. So I suppose it's it just showcasing that you know you can you can use your time efficiently and we know farmers are doing it and how they're managing to do it then is by having you know good facilities and technology good work practices 
you know, good time management and good organization skills. So all those things are contributing to making sure that um, you know, you're using your time efficiently. Um, and I suppose then the last two slides, Stuart, that I have is just a little case study. So this is from one of the firms that was um, involved in the study in that spring summer period. And he's, they're managing about 118 cows and for that period from January or into, Feb into January, start of February to June, it was a 1400 hours just over was required to operate the farm. Coming out about 12 and a half, 12.1 hours per cow or about roughly around, it was a rough approximation of about 22, 23 hours um, annually. So a really, really efficient operator. Um, and this guy, you know, he's the family and the, the farm that's running it is one of the most, you know, profitable farms in the country and it's, you know, consistently, and the profit monitor that Chagas run um, is coming out on top. So, and he's hitting all, I suppose, the key, the key um, physical performance indicators as well. So he's, you know, six week calving rate is 91%, you know, managing to do that in a nine and a half week breeding season. His hours worked per week, even in springtime is 46 hours. Um, so, and he's got a, a lot of non-farming activity during the day. Um, so he's, you know, his average day length is about, uh, 11 and a half, 12 hours in the day. But again, you know, he can't manage the farm all by himself. So he's getting, you know, the contractor um, and also there's a good good share of family family um, help input into that farm as well to operate it. But I suppose, how is he achieving the 46 hours per week? You know, I think it's a pretty phenomenal um, performance or, you know, hours work per week in, in that springtime, even when, you know, it's the busiest period on farm. And I think anything we could do to improve that spring period is, is going to be, as I said, helpful overall. So he's doing that by having good facilities we talked about. So he's got, you know, 20 unit parlor, um, ACRs, dump line, auto washer, drafting, um, entry and exit gates that are operated from um, everywhere, from within the pit. And so some people might think that's a bit overkill, I suppose. For me, it's, you know, he worked hard to, and he's got his farm performing. So his cows and grass are doing really, really well, which enables him to invest back into his business. Um, and he's able to put money back in that will save him time ultimately. And I suppose he's also setting up the farm that if he ever did want to expand, he has the facilities there in place to do so. Then in terms of the calving and calf housing, you know, it's all being able to be mechanically cleaned out. So there's no, you know, hard work in terms of, um, physically cleaning out the houses, it all can be done mechanically and he's an automatic calf eater as well. And then in terms of the practices, what he's doing, so he's doing once a day milking for two weeks, you know, he's operating a 16-8 milking interval, which means, you know, he's able to finish up at a reasonable time every evening. Um, the contractor spreads slurry, he feeds silage um, every second day, calves are contract reared um, and goes to contract rear after weaning at nine weeks. Um, and even though he has out blocks of, of land, he actually uses those for um, um, silage production as opposed to, I suppose normally we're used to seeing any out blocks being used for heifer rearing. Well, actually he used, he, he's gone down the route of changing those over to um, using them for, for silage as opposed to calf rearing. Um, and then he also uses technology in terms of moon monitors and herd watch app. So I suppose all of those practices and facilities are contributing to allowing him to efficiently use his time and spend, I suppose, you know, a reasonable working week um, on the farm. So that's a, just a very brief, I suppose, um, overview, Stuart, uh, of what I have today. Um, and hopefully Nolik will be able to pull up on a, or, you know, I suppose add on a few different points as to how to become more organized and improve that um, time use as well. Okay, so Marin, I suppose just to go back because I suppose it's um, it was interesting when you when I saw this information for the first time. The the kind of the the downtime or the dead time that may, can be in the course of the day. I suppose just to clarify for people that that's not necessarily that they're making bad use of time, but that they're actually maybe doing a lot of other things that they don't uh, that aren't farming related, but are contributing to the length of their day and how. Um, yeah. I suppose, can we refine those or tighten those up maybe to make the day that bit shorter or can we look to offload some other task somewhere along the way so that the day doesn't uh, expand too far? And then I suppose the other question then is, um, we'll say 
in the case study, the work practices would have been pushed to the absolute limit first before any of the technology was brought in. And, and is that a very important point that before you go spending on something to save time, you have to make sure that you're saving or doing it as efficiently as possible in the first place, really? Yeah, so absolutely, Stuart. In terms of the downtime, as you said, yes, it's, it's, it's time that's spent not on necessarily on the farming activities, but it is time that's spent doing other jobs that are, you know, usually of incredible value. So it could be like picking up the kids from school, looking after elderly parents, um, you know, minding your kids after school, whatever it is. Um, and then, of course, obviously, you know, within that work a day, you need to have breaks yourself in terms of, you know, making sure that you get time to eat and rest and, you know, um, and all that. So absolutely, it's... It, there's a there's a fine line and there's a balance between um i suppose that the amount of downtime you have during the day and also tightening up your 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 working day so it's about either as you said Stuart, you know if those are jobs that you know you can't get someone else to do and you know you have responsibilities in terms of looking after parents well maybe is there a case that you can bring in someone for an evening milking or um you know helping out with other parts of the jobs that can actually help you to, it's supposed to, to, to use your best time to, to your maximum um, effect. And then, it, yes, absolutely, in terms of the case study, it is absolutely crucial. Yeah, that is a good point that the farmer, you know, he had to work through, I suppose, um, less than optimum facilities for, for a period of time. Um, and, you know, I think that's part and parcel, but I suppose everyone can do that once you know that there's a means to an end. And particularly if you've got staff working on the farm, um, they will tend to stay with you if they know it's only a short term thing. But if you keep saying, you know, oh, we're going to improve the milking parlor next year and next year comes and it never changes, you know, you, you've kind of lost your your goodwill with the employees um, and also with yourself. So I think, yes, it, you will. There will be probably time periods when facilities and practices are less than optimum, but it's a case of knowing when you're going to change them and also, as you said, making sure that you're efficiently running them as, as best you can. So if, if you're milking parlor, as you know, we saw two weeks ago with Aidan the Hearn, you know, milking 13 rows of cows is a bit unsustainable, but you know, he's, he's operating it as efficiently as possible in terms of all his practices to streamline it to make it as, as easy a run as possible. Yeah, and just to just come back to um, Aidan, actually, I was just going to say as well, the fact that he has kind of plans to go to the bigger parlour in due course, how long does the goodwill last potentially with, uh, I think it was Stephen was the guy that was working for him, Do you know, okay, we're going to do the parlour, but like, if, if that's next December, it, it's a lot more palatable than if it's like three years time. But if you tell them straight out and it's three years time, to, to, I suppose it's more nearly a question from your point of view, Nolik, with the psychology side of things. Are people going to be accepting of that? And like, you know, in, in Aidan's case, like he's obviously swapping or he's milking as well. So it, everybody wasn't milking the whole time. Or there was no one person milking the whole time. So they weren't getting too much of it. Like, but um, how far can you push the goodwill in terms of like fi the finances on farms are the are the challenge. If every farmer had an open checkbook, they'd have all the facilities and all the the uh, the gizmos to make time as efficient as possible. Even though they mightn't still be as efficient with their time in the end of it. But so, what's your thoughts on that? Um, just I mean, I probably refer to some of the things really uh, when I when I do my slides. But showing willing along the way, so you can you you know people will take very harsh treatment if it's, it's strict but fair. So if I, if I can see the value in what you're trying to achieve. Now, if, if you had somebody like Aidan flittering his money on, on everything else and not investing in the parlour, so he's not actually walking the talk, you know, he's saying one thing and quite clearly showing something else. But if he's showing, if you've got an individual who's shown willing, who is demonstrating that they are working towards that end goal, people will buy into that and be part of that. So, and it's just, you know, and it's putting for, for somebody who has that big investment project um, in mind, putting a deadline on it and, and making yourself move towards it. So talking about from the psychology point of view, the head, our brains like they're target focused. We like to have something to work towards. So it's really important that for everybody involved in that system, that there is a definite goal of we will turn the sod by X date. 
to show that you are getting on with what you're trying to achieve. But certainly along the way, making life as easy as possible. And as, as Marion said, making things efficient where at all possible. And again, we don't have to talk about big expenditure. We can just tighten up our own practices in terms of how we manage things. Looking for smart solutions, not necessarily expensive solutions. Okay. And, and Nolik, sorry, sure, I just got a question in, in terms of that, Nolik, you know, you say if you, if it's in three years time and you say, oh, I'm going to plan to turn this on, as you said, in three, week, three years time, but I suppose I've come across a number of farmers where things have happened in the meantime, where, you know, land has come up for sale and, you know, oh, they have to get that land and end up then buying that land and not necessarily would say having the money they're supposed to spend on the parallel then, so then, you know, things get pushed back. So how does that work? Yeah. Um I, I'll answer it as a distraction control during the slides, I think is the easiest way okay. to do it. It's very, it's very much about understanding and having that conversation and saying to your staff, this opportunity has arisen, there's land here. What, you know, and, and having the conversation, I want to go for the land, but it doesn't mean I'm pushing back. You know, communication is key and, and speaking about it. And if, if you've got somebody like in Irish operations, no matter how big your farm is in Ireland, it's small in terms of people management. So people are directly impacted every day by your decision making bringing the people in your system on board in the decision making makes that harsh but fair. So, oh, okay, you know what? I see the value in getting that piece of land. It's ideally situated. That makes, you know, on paper, that's, that is actually a rational and better decision than investing a huge amount in the concrete of the, of the parlor. So how can we get around it? But doing it without engaging people when you promise something, you know, not full, you don't have to fulfill your promise straight away, but if you're not going to fulfill it, communicating why, with clear and logical reasons, people will buy into that. And I suppose, again, if you come with a solution, so I will say, in that case, like, I'm I'm picking on Aiden as such now, but we'll say if Aiden ended up going to 15 or 16 rows because of some a scenario like you've outlined there, Marion, maybe it's a case of getting that extra person in to do a couple of milkings yeah. rather than expecting to guide its way to do the all the extra work, like we'll say, isn't it? Sure, and it's, you're, you're compromising there as well. You're acknowledging the hardship that you're putting on the other person and you're, you're doing your best to offset that by bringing in somebody extra. Yes, yeah, spot on, Stuart. Okay, so um, you can start to share there, so Nolig, and I suppose the question that I'll put to you both, as I said, um, I've had a few calls from the owner-operators, we'll say around how you manage these people that aren't actually working in your business all the time, that they're more casual labour um, aside from the, the situation of actually bringing them into the and paying them and so forth that exists now which is a uh, something we'll try to cover in the next number of weeks maybe um, but how you actually communicate with them on an ongoing basis or what way what do you recommend because obviously if you're not meeting them every day but you want them for two days next week what kind of level of communication are they expecting from you what kind of level of communication should you be having with them do you know you can't always you should you be ringing them the day before to make sure that they haven't forgotten that they're to come to you the day after etc etc absolutely is the answer to that and um, I, I don't know if everybody who signed up for your for your talks uh, for the let's talk dairy Stuart gets the email but I certainly got an email yesterday say, yesterday saying the talk is tomorrow I got an email an hour ago saying it's in an hour you know people are busy they've got other things on and they get distracted for whatever reasons, you know. So, you know, do, the biggest thing is don't allow, don't expose your business to risk. And if that means giving an extra phone call, give the extra phone call. And what that will happen is you'll do that initially and you'll remind them. And then at some point you'll realize this person's got it. They are going to come when I say they're going to come. I don't need to ring them anymore. But again, that's a conversation. How can I remind you? And allowing them to say, look, Stuart, you don't need to ring me anymore. I will come when I say I will. You know, I, you can trust that I'll come to your work. So, okay. Um, okay. <laughs> so, look, just uh, thank you very much to Makra, who um, have, have asked me to speak on this as well. Of course, we do the, the people management courses and uh, time management is just constantly, when we do the people management courses with, with Chagas and Makra and the processors, it just always comes back to a conversation around time and time management. So it is a critical one and uh, it's a learnable skill set. So what I would say to everybody who feels overwhelmed by this idea of managing time Time is money, and so it's a multi-billion dollar industry. There are a huge amount of skill sets, huge amount of training, huge amount of apps available. Um, I suppose what somebody's going to say is, well, where, do I, where will I get the time to find out about those things? Uh, no, no, it doesn't have to be arduous. It's, just, it's about being smart. So we're really talking about being smart here and just taking a few minutes to, to, to invest in yourself in this, in this idea. So just, um, I'm going to just repeat some of the things that have been said. I'm going to relate this back to what Marion presented. Um, 
we do have a lot of perception and a lot of strange ideas about time and we need to challenge those. We need to challenge our own relationship with time. So one of the, the, um, the, one of the things I would see particularly with farmers is the value of time, a belief that everybody um, feels the same about their time as, as they do. So you'd, I'd often hear from a farmer, oh, should that fella be out the gate at five o'clock? You know, no, no hanging around. And being offended that that person doesn't want to stay on the farm with them. But that person has value. You know, your employees have value elsewhere. They don't share the same value of time that you do. You value your business and you're totally committed to it. They might value their going off to play their sports or picking up their children or whatever it is. So we need to be mindful that just because I, I view time in one way doesn't mean the next person does. And when we start thinking about that, we get a much better communication relationship with, with our, our staff, for example, ourselves. So just be, you know, when we think, oh, that fella didn't show up, that's terrible. He doesn't value my time. Well, maybe something happened to that person. What if that person had a sick child the night before and couldn't get to you and didn't manage to ring? So we need to be a little bit more empathetic with ourselves and with other people around the concept of time. Um, I'm going to hang Stuart here because he said when they made time, they didn't make enough of it. Well, no matter who you are, no matter the size of your operation, you got the same amount of time. What's the difference between the extraordinarily highly effective person who accomplishes extraordinary amounts? It's just a better use of time the same asset but a better use of it so what we really need to think about is being proactive about time and being an agent rather than a victim and I'm a psychologist and if I went into any business or dealt with anybody who's under pressure when people are under pressure and stressed they all use the exact same statement I don't have time which makes you feel like a victim of time so one of the first things I would do is sit down and say right how can we make your time more efficient? Exactly like Marion spoke about looking at your facilities, looking at what you're doing on a daily basis. Did you, were you two hours late coming in? Because actually you spent two hours late speaking to the sales rep in the yard. You know, so it's challenging yourself about that. This is an important one, busyness versus productivity. I have an exclamation mark there. We could be highly productive. We could be getting a load of stuff done, but doing completely the wrong stuff. So it's about effective productivity. You could be hugely efficient at doing the wrong thing. So we need to talk about effective productivity. And if it's effective productivity, it will be efficient. But just because you're efficient doesn't mean that you're effective. Okay, so we need to challenge our assumptions around that. But I'm really good at doing that. Yes, but it's the wrong thing to do. So we need to look at being effectively productive. And I love, I, I keep thinking of, of Marion's um, talk that when we spoke before in, in November, and she talks about you know, um, saying we worked a 12 hour day when in reality, when we broke it down, it was a nine hour day on the farm with other things happening in between. That's a really, really interesting um, idea. I had a great um, comment from a, a guy in a discussion group last year saying he was part of one of those studies with Marion and Justine. And um, he had put on, his, he was timing himself and next thing the phone call rang and he lost half an hour instantly just because he, ran, he answered the phone. So it's challenging ourselves about are we busy or are we losing time by not being switched on to what we're trying to achieve? And we also find down here, and I would say this is just endemic in farming. So this bottom comment, we are over ambitious on a daily basis and not ambitious enough on a long-term basis. Now, what does that mean? We are devastated with ourselves. We feel dreadful. We feel guilty. I had a dreadful day's work. Oh, it was rubbish. I got nothing done. And what you fundamentally need to ask yourself as a dairy farmer, if you've milked, the, have I milked the cows? Yes. Have I fed the cows? Yes. Are the cows safe? Yes. Have I, you know, that's what a dairy farmer does. On any day that you achieve those things, you have had a good day's work and everything else is a bonus. So we need to be self, less, less self-deprecating, a little bit more self, self um, we, we'd call it, you know, having self-empathy or self-emotion. You know, being just careful not to, to, to beat yourself up. Because when we don't get work done, we, um, we, we have a negative emotional reaction. And then we start feeling guilt. And then the next time we try to do a big workload, what do, what do we associate with not doing it? Guilt. So we have a negative um, connotation about the whole thing before we even start it. So we need to be very mindful about how we feel about things and just sit down and say, okay, I would like to have fenced paddock X. I would like to have done that. I didn't get it done today. I can get it done tomorrow. There's an opportunity to do it tomorrow. And just taking that it's a good day's work. Um, and that, it, that is absolutely key for the person who's working on their own um, who doesn't have, have full-time labor, that they're giving themselves a bit of credit for the amount of work that they are getting done, you know, and that they, are, they have viable businesses that, that are running well. They just, you, we need to be far less um, aggressive on ourselves, I suppose, more, more empathetic towards ourselves. So the fact about time is that it's a finite resource. So we, uh, Marion, can say that very clearly. Once it's gone, it's gone. And when it's gone, it's really gone. 
there's an opportunity cost with, with um, time. So we can, we can run a lot of the principles we would use with money and finance, we can apply to time. So there's an opportunity cost of time. If I'm spending time chatting to the sales rep who's selling a product I don't even want, what am I not doing? So I, there's an opportunity cost with that time. I'm, I'm missing out somewhere else. I'm not getting the job done, which means I'm in later in the evening. And because I'm in later in the evening, I'm spending less time with my children, et cetera, et cetera, or whatever it is you do in the evening. So we need to understand that by doing this, I can't do something else. And that's how you create value around a task. You understand what's the most important thing to do now. Parkinson's law is a very famous law. It's uh, the, the idea that the time will expand, the, the task expands to fit the time available. And so we find that highly effective people don't think about how long the job will take, they think about how long, how, how much time have I got to do the job? So that's a different proposition. It's not saying, oh, this has got, you know, I, oh, this will take about 10 hours to do it. It's saying, I've only got eight hours to do this. So how am I going to do it efficiently? How am I going to get it done in that time? And that comes back to Stuart's point about the psychology um, and, and understanding and putting a deadline in place. The brain needs something to track to. So it's uh, one of my best ever comments from a farmer was, it's amazing how you can get a day's work done in the last half an hour before even milking. Why is that? Because there's a definite finishing time. We're focused, we're on it. We're not being distracted because, oh my God, we're milking in half an hour. So it's really important that we put those barriers in place. Every single person uh, who's listening today has a mobile phone. Do not be afraid to put a timer on your phone and get the alarm to ring and be disciplined to walk away even when the job isn't finished. Okay, now that, that's going to break your heart, but be disciplined to walk away even when the job isn't finished because if you hang on doing that job, you're pushing out your other tasks. So it's really important we think about that. How long have I got to do the job rather than how long will the job take? And we come down to here, which is something else that breaks people's hearts, is that we know from lean management and all the studies on it that multitasking is highly inefficient. So when we do all the jobs that we're supposed to do on any day, and there's plenty of them, we have a narrow window. So time on farm gets wasted in the narrow window that's not accounted for. The most efficient part of farming is milking because um, you're doing something for a set amount of time. Or every, and that's what you focus on. You're not running off and doing the accounts halfway through the milking, you're coming back, you know, you're sticking with that job until it is finished. So we know that's really efficient. You need to apply that principle to other jobs that you do. You have a start and a finish and you're focused on that job. And when you start productively accounting for that middle spongy time in the day, that's when you start to see businesses really starting to move and getting that nice finishing time that's so attractive to employees. I don't know if Stuart wants to come in there with a comment or if I'll keep going well, or Marion. Yeah, no, it's interesting. Uh, no, like I, I think it's, uh, and, and I suppose I'd just like you to focus for one minute and we'll say, just take from my, from my own part perspective working for Chagas, we'll say the phone rings today, say Marion is ringing me about doing something tomorrow. Um, that's obviously a high priority. And I need to talk to her about that. But I'm also trying to get something else done today that needs to be done for this evening. How do you balance up? Like, do I actually answer the phone to her or do I say, right, I'm going to ring her back? Or like, because like you said, like I, I can't multitask anyway, because as soon as Marion, as I start talking to Marion, I get distracted and I nearly have to go back to the start of what I was doing to try to find my way to where was I originally like. So, Spot we, on. yeah, I, I'm. Yeah, absolutely spot on. Look, this is, this is, hard. This is a, an extraordinary waste of time. Like, I'll explain this to you from a psychology point of view. So um, imagine you're, you're in a piece of work and you're really focused and it's going really well. And, and it's, you're in this, what we call a state of flow. So we've got, got a lot of research about the state of flow. It's optimum performance. You're totally stuck in it. You're in a groove. Um, time flies, you know, everything feels easy and you're, you're doing well. If you, are, if you are at that focused in what you're doing and somebody interrupts you, it takes a minimum of 15 minutes to return to that level of concentration if you do it all. So the phone, you know, if people say to me, do you blame the phone? Isn't the phone to blame for all of this? No phone on the planet takes a gun out of itself and says, answer me or die. It is your choice to answer the phone. So what you would have is a triage system. Stuart, you know Marion has to call you today, so that's a protected concept. Um, anybody else, you don't need to speak to them today. The other thing I would say very, very importantly is, is, is schedule your calls. So people will ring me, for example, people will ring me and they'll go, 
I'm, I'm stuck in something that's not related to farming in any way whatsoever. It's some other piece of work that I'm doing. And Stuart rings me. Now, I know 10 Stuarts. And Stuart rings up and says, hi, it's Stuart. And I've got to get my head out of the piece of work I'm in and literally can imagine a filing cabinet in my head and the files are going, who the hell is Stuart? What are we going to talk about here? And I'm, I'm kind of fluffing around until I realize, oh, yeah, yeah, it's Stuart. It's Chagas. We need to talk about dairy. So when you can schedule your call and, and anybody who works with me knows this, I will say, can you speak to me at 10 o'clock about let's talk dairy? So the minute I speak to you at 10 o'clock, you're primed and ready for that conversation. You know what we're going to speak about and we can get down to business. Now, this is not about being rude or about being officious. This is about me not wasting your time and you not wasting my time. And that is the most complimentary thing you can do to anybody. So I would be very, very particular about saying, you know, for yourselves, who is likely to call me tomorrow? Which of those calls can I reschedule for another time? I'm not saying I'm ignoring the call. I'm just saying that I won't answer it now. So it's very important that the minute you answer the phone, you have put that to number one of your priority list that day and you've shoved everything else down. And then at the end of the day, we're disappointed we didn't get work done. So it's really about preempting what's likely to come. And we should be doing this the day before. We could even be doing it the week before because we know from the brain that the more information you can give it in advance, it does what we call priming. So it, it, it actually does what we call incubating. So the subconscious works through that. And it's like when you say, oh, I'll, it's when you wake up and you have the solution. You couldn't get your head around it the day before. The next day you wake up and you go, bang, that's it. I know exactly what to do. That's because your brain didn't let it go. It's been working on it since then, even if you haven't been consciously working on it. So the brain is a phenomenally powerful uh, processing machine. And when we use it effectively, we can really manage our time much better. We can achieve more, far more, and we're far more efficiently and effectively productive. Okay, so I would say to everybody, schedule your calls. Okay, just to come back on it now, a, a counter argument. Okay. <laughs> um, from from our perspective, we'll say for the people that are tuning in, well and good. Um, f- from our perspective, that that might be feasible, but in some case, like I think the phone has been a bad thing in that, like uh, the air code has been a fantastic invention in my opinion because it stopped an awful lot of people ringing me looking for directions to get to where they need to get to, but. Um, in some cases, though, like that phone call, how much of a level of it, does that distract you equally as much? So say you ring me looking for the directions to my house. I, I give them to you. I have the job done. It's out of the way. I don't have to go back to you again. But I did answer the phone and it has distracted me from what I was doing. Is it still having the same impact? Um, well, I would, I would strip that back a little bit and go, well, when you made that order or you spoke to that person in the first place and agreed they were coming to your house, why didn't you give them the directions then for example so that's what a courier is going to do they're going to say any notes you talk about the air code we've got where I live I've got two entrances you do not want to be a a delivery van coming down the back entrance to the house because it's you know you're going to have a nicely possibly ripped off top of your van and but so there's always a very important ignore the air code take this road to my house and make sure you come that entrance so you're preempting that in in, in advance if you're if you know many farms are difficult to find that's part of the conversation you have beforehand. And you, make, you get your instructions as tight as possible so that people can find your, your, um, find your, your address be, w- without having to call you several times. So it's just, it's just stepping it back a little bit. And, and we call that root cause analysis. So what, what's the root cause of that issue? The root cause of the issue is that I should have given them better information from the beginning and thinking about it like that. And we would say that with employees. Why didn't the employee do the job I wanted them to? Well, if we strip it back, Actually, I didn't give them the time, the resources or sufficient training to do that properly. So we're coming right back. And it's something about my behavior that prevented that from being done properly. So you would be anticipating a delivery because you've, you've organized that. And yeah, certainly your brain would be half listening out for that. But um, knowing that you, you're, you, would, you would keep that as a task that's as important that day. And you might say to yourself, I won't get stuck into task B because that really requires my attention. I'll wait till the delivery comes and then I'll get into stuck into task B while I'm waiting for the delivery because I don't want to be sitting around twiddling my thumbs. These are the jobs I could do. So every farm should have a list of 10 minute jobs that could be done when there's 10 minutes available. So we're stripping, we're stripping work right down to I've got 10 minutes before I have to go and collect the kids. What's a good thing I could get done that needs to be done um, but isn't, isn't crucial. I can get it done in that 10 minutes and feel that that's, that's over and done with. So it's, it's really just stripping it back and understanding where there are opportunities to save time in your business. Okay. 
No, but sorry, just to come in on that, sorry, sure. just to come in on that, you know, the idea of having these 10 minute jobs. So we all know I've got a 10 minute job and that 10 minute job turns into 20 minutes or an hour or, you know, just because discipline. something has happened or it leads, a bigger jo- it leads to a bigger job that, you know, you think it's only a small job and then you realize it's actually a much bigger job. So how can you prevent that, I suppose, or manage it, that? It is just discipline, Marion. It is absolutely discipline. And it's the ability not to be sucked into the fact this could be a 60 hour job if I let it be. So if you've got 10 minutes, you use the 10 minutes and then move on to your next job. And that's where we talk about multitasking. If you, it's, it's the brain likes a process to be finished. So you've got, um, you, it's frustrating to leave those little jobs open, so, but they're, they're not as frustrating and as, as, as mentally distracting as leaving the big jobs open. So you want to crack on with your big jobs and then you just happen to have that 10 minute job where you have a 10 minute job that is finished in that process. You've totally, Marion, misunderstood the job if it turns into more than a 10 minute job. So it's stepping back to that root cause and saying, okay, that's a bigger job, so I can't slot it into the 10-minute job because I'm opening a can of worms that I'm, I don't have time to work with. So we'd step it back and we'd say, okay, is that a 10-minute job or is it a much bigger job than that? That's how you would look at something like that. And again, we're, we're really coming back to what's on my plate on any one day and what, where, are my, where are my opportunities? You cannot do that on the spot. You have to plan that in advance. You just can't do that on the spot. You'll do what Marion described. You'll delve into the job you shouldn't touch on the spot. But if you're thinking about an advance, you'll say to yourself, I'm not delving into that one because that's a huge one. But here's a little one that if I get it, if I get that done, that's handy. That's the way to look at that. So okay. all of this is about planning and priming. Sorry, Stuart. No, you're going to come in there, Marion, Maria. Right? Yeah, no, I was going to say, like I, I, like, I totally agree. And I think the planning is, uh, you know, is absolutely key. But what I hear a lot from farmers is, I'm too busy to plan. I, you know, you're too. Where do you find the time to take out and you know actually you know say you know these are the three jobs I want to get done today and these are the two important phone calls I'm expecting or whatever. You know, it's. I think, I, like I buy into it and I, I think everyone. How do you manage it? I suppose, or how do you how do you make it work if you're if you're that busy that you can't take the time to I'll, plan it? I'll describe it. I'll, I'll use my next slide to answer answer the question, Ryan. Okay, um, it is when we talk about behavior change, if you, if, you don't, if you don't believe it, if you think you don't have the time, you're not going to do this stuff anyway. So it's about you have to have sufficient why to stimulate that change. And this is what we need to think about. So we all know about the financial benefit. We all know about, you know, ease of, ease of calving and, and physically setting up the parlor. But what's in it for you? And all, all behavior, I'll just blank that for a moment. All behavior comes down to uh, all changes, any change in the system. Every single person will look at any change in the system from their own perspective. W-I-I-F-M. What's in it for me? I can listen to Stuart and Marion and Nolig talk about this all day, but what's in it for me? Well, here are some of the things that are in it for you, okay? Why do we want effective time management? Positive self-concept. Let's reverse that. How rubbish do you feel at the end of the day when you didn't get through the jobs you wanted to do? So if you buy into feeling better at the end of the day, not being wrapped with guilt, which is just endemic in farming because you feel you didn't get your stuff done. That's a great reason to do it. Stress management. I mentioned it earlier. What does everybody say when, they don't have, when they're stressed? I don't have enough time. I don't have time to do this. Wouldn't it be nice to feel I've got a bit of time to work on the business rather than always with my head stuck in the business? Wouldn't it be nice to have guilt-free time off and guilt-free work? So that's, that's a real thing to aim for, guilt-free time off and guilt-free work. You're working without feeling guilty that you're not, uh, that you're not taking, that, you know, you're not feeling guilty about working because you've protected the time that you're having outside of work. You're not feeling guilty on holidays or not working because you've done what you're supposed to do during work. So we're looking for guilt-free and that sense of achievement. Now, achievement is one of, is achievement and recognition are the biggest motivators in the workplace. You feel so good about yourself when you do well. So these are what we need to buy into. Yes, absolutely, every day of the week, make your system more efficient. Make money out of managing your time better. But if you can buy into what's in it for you and how you will feel about it, as opposed to what you can, you know, physically gain from it. If you think about how you feel about it, that's really worth investing in. The next thing we would look at is others. You know, if you're managing other people's time, you're creating a huge amount of respect. We would see this massively. The biggest deal breaker in dairy, in Irish dairy, is a lack of a definite finishing time. You know, because that's saying you don't respect my time. And this person could be the nicest person to you in the world, but if I can't get home at five o'clock to collect my children, that's a deal breaker. So we're talking about using time as respect. Time is a time is one of the fundamental communicators. 
I need you to do this now. That doesn't need to be done till next week. We're taught, we talk all about, we talk, we use time to communicate everything. Is it urgent? Is it important? And that, again, that feeling of success. If you've got a robust and efficient system, like who listening today, if you're an employee, who listening today did not want to work for the farm that Marion described? There's not a single person here who doesn't think, God, I'd love to be part of that. That's a successful system. I live in Coolmore country. People will kill to wear a Coolmore jacket because people want to be part of that success story. So we need to think about what, what's in it for me. It's far bigger than being a financial advantage. It's, it's self-respect, it's self-esteem. It's creating an entity that other people want to be part of. And it is all doable. But the day you say, you know, for me, and I'm going to be really harsh, and, I, and I'm sure, you know, I have been personally attacked for saying things like this. It's an excuse. To say you don't have time is an excuse because the next person is able to do this, why can't you? So you need to put the excuse away and rather than say, I don't have time to do this, it's saying, this is the most important thing I could do with my time today. What's in it for me? An abundance of return. What's, what, you know, really applying yourself. And in terms of your business, your productivity is higher, your reputation, you know, if, if somebody struggles to get somebody in, and I'm not talking about massive employers, if you struggle to get somebody in, maybe it's because you're not managing their time when they come into the system. The day you manage their time when they come into the system, they're going to return to you because they know you're not wasting their time. So that's about reputation, that people are getting done what they expected to get done and getting paid fairly for it, et cetera. And of course, it's sustainable. If you are killing yourself working crazy hours and not, you know, not looking after yourself, not looking after your own time, not respecting yourself as the key employee in your farm, if that is not sustainable, unfortunately. And when we see people who are good at stress management, they have often been taken to the very edge and, and been in a bad place before they've stood back and said, maybe I should manage my time effectively. That is learning the excruciatingly hard way. We need to sit down now and this, you know, we would, and I have all these arguments, God, I practically have arm wrestles when I do the people management courses because people will say, well, I can't do it because of this and I can't do it because of that. We need to stop saying can't because that's automatically putting the barrier up and saying how. How could I do this? Where could I find an option for myself? So look, Marion, you're absolutely right. I have no doubt, we, you know, I meet them myself as everybody saying, can't do this, I can't do that. You can. You just need to, instead of the 20 minutes you spent watching a Netflix episode, sit down and use that time productively. At the end of the day, the finish of your working day shouldn't be locking the cows in at night. It should be writing your to-do list for what I need to achieve tomorrow. That's the end of your working day. Because you then go back, to, you, you know what you're expected to do tomorrow. You wake up primed and ready. You're not looking around going, oh, today's Wednesday. What do I do? Oh, it's Thursday, actually. <laughs> Time management. Today is Thursday. What do I do today? You know, because you wrote it the day before and your brain is up and ready for action. And that's exactly what you would do with any single person who's coming in to contribute to your farm from an employment point of view. Getting the person primed and ready. John, you're coming into my farm tomorrow. This is what I, I'll, I'll be asking you to do. You'll be feeding the cattle. That'll take you about X amount of time. And then I really need, um, then we're going to work on fencing or fixing whatever. We're going to fix the water trough up and whatever. And you're giving them that, the opportunity to know what they're doing. And this comes down to energy expenditure. It is literally down to how much porridge do I need to eat on any day? Literally. Like we're talking about a physical exertion. If I don't know what I'm to do all day long today, how can I pace myself? If I know what's expected of me, I know what to expect. And I'm not going to give 100. I often find employees saying, God, they were brilliant in the beginning. My employees were fantastic in the beginning and they've just, they've just slacked off. And a lot of it is because everybody comes into your business to make a good impression, but you didn't explain what was expected of them. They gave 100% to the first task, which turned out to be the easiest task of the day. So they didn't know how to gauge their energy appropriately. That is literally coming back to how much fuel do I need to sustain this day? And you will not be able to gauge that if people aren't priming you and getting you ready in advance for what it is you're trying to achieve. And that's the same with yourselves. So you know it yourself, God, I have a big day today now, I better fuel up. You can hear yourself saying that. You can hear those conversations yourself. Um, and it's just really about thinking about how can you set up a day that is productive for yourself, get your brain ready and in gear. Don't underestimate how important your, your, the psychology of time management is. We, we always talk about the financial benefit, but the psychology of, of time management, you know, feeling good about yourself, feeling confident, that's priceless. And that allows you to take, you know, when you're having a bad day, if you feel good about yourself, you're like, ha, huh, it's a bad day, water off the duck's back. If you're feeling badly about yourself and you're having a bad day, 
well, there we go again, just typical. This always happens to me. Life is rubbish. I don't have time. So it spirals very quickly in either direction. The thing is you have a choice to decide which direction you want it to spiral in. And that's what, what the psychology of time management is about. So I'm getting a bit excited there. Sorry, very passionate about this idea of time management. And, um, and we've only 15 sorry. minutes left now, so we better, in, given the okay. topic, we better I'm, finish at 11. <laughs> I'm going to, absolutely we will. I'm just going to, to, on that, I'm just going to give you a couple of things. This is my time management toolbox. Um, we talked about planning and, and uh, Marion, we talked about the benefit of planning. We look at the discount planner, we look at task prioritization. So that's using that language of is it urgent and is it important? Understanding that if I take the phone call, I have prioritized that phone call, I've made it urgent and I've made it important. Phone calls are only important if you choose to answer them. So we look at that very strongly. I just have that separated off because we will look at that, those ideas, the planning and the task prioritization when we look at the planning um, exercise on, I think it's the 7th of January. This is a very famous one here. And this is, this really is, um, uh, Lou Holtz was a, an American football player and a football coach. And he famously coined the, the expression, win, what's important now? And what's important now is based on this idea of the Pareto principle. So many of you will have heard of the 80-20 rule. Pareto was a, an economist from the, an Italian economist in the 1920s. And he said, 80% um, of the world's wealth is owned by 20% of the population. What we find is that, that uh, though it was done as an economic principle, it actually holds true for many, many things. So as a business, 80% of your revenue will come from 20% of your customers. If you're in a large organization, 80% of your employee issues would be caused by 20% of your employee issues. 80% of your productivity would be attributable to 20% of your employees because in terms of management structure, uh, you've got different um, consequences of the work that's being done. Uh, the 20% that are most troublesome and the 20% that are most productive never overlap. So if we can apply a Pareto principle and say, what is the thing that gain, gives us most return? And for example, milking, and, and let's face it, dairy farmers are good at prioritizing milking. You're putting energy and effort into your milking because that's got a huge return for you. It's having that um, very strong discipline to say, what's important now? Where is the waiting? Of all the tasks I could do today, what contributes most to my business? What, what provides the 80% return? And realistically, when we look at farming, and if I went into a business, Spending a lot of time doing, doing work that doesn't contribute to the overall principle of your farm, to the long-term vision of your farm, we need to be disciplined not to get sucked into that. So weighting the thing and saying on any day, this job is the most important thing I could achieve today. And if I got 80% of this job done, if I got 60% of this job done, in addition to my other tasks, don't forget we've got all our daily routine tasks as well, in addition to the other tasks, that's a really good step forward in my business. So weighting your jobs is very, very important and applying your focus, energy and attention to the most critical ones rather than being get, you know, getting sucked into the easy ones are the ones that you like most. So mere mortals get sucked into the easy ones are the ones they like most and maybe don't tackle the things that are most critical to their farm. So on any day, it's being very, very clear about what will contribute the most value to my business. Saying no is just... You know, it's one of the most powerful words, and it's probably the most powerful word in the English language. We need to learn to say no. I'm not saying being um, aggressive. I'm talking about being assertive. And being assertive is about saying no, but protecting your own integrity and the, and the integrity of the person that you're, you're saying no to. The easiest way to say no is to understand what you're saying yes to. So if you understand what you're protecting, you don't feel badly saying no. So I'm saying no to the sales rep in the yard for two hours because I'm saying yes to being at home for my children in the evening. Now, because I know what I'm saying no to, it makes it much easier to say to the sales rep, I'm sorry, I'm not interested in your product. Uh, thanks very much for calling. It makes it much easier because I know what I'm saying yes to, it's my children. If I don't understand what I'm protecting, I feel a bit of a villain, I feel a bit of a baddie, I feel rude saying, please leave my yard, I'm not interested in your, in your product. So get a, your head around what it is you want to achieve from, far, from your farming day. I want to be able to have guilt-free time off. I want to be able to go to my GAA training this evening. You know, whatever it is, understanding what it is you're saying yes to makes it much easier to say no. It's the discipline, yes, the phone is ringing, but I'm not going to answer it. Just because it's ringing doesn't mean I have to answer it. So it's really challenging yourself around those things. Distraction control. What are the things that distract you? Is it, the, is it worry about what your neighbors will say? Is it going down to the mart and listening to somebody else talking about this, that, and the other? Is it 
is it potentially looking at a, as, as a, a, a case study and thinking, God, I'll never achieve what that farmer has achieved. I, I'm, I'm, I'm overwhelmed by it and I can't buy into it. You know, it's, it's really about what's right for you sitting down and, you know, having some acid tests. One of the things I would always say to people is, you know, that person's opinion that you're so wound up about, are they going to hold your hand in the middle of the night when you can't sleep worrying about this thing? And if they're not, if they're not a significant stakeholder in your business that can make you happy or contribute to your business, you know, you need to let go of that and not be distracted by it. It could be that you're mercilessly attached to social media and actually you're so busy wondering what everybody else is doing, you're not getting on with what you should be doing. Um, it could be that you, you just spend too much time watching television. I think one of the most uh, startling things that was ever said to me was um, a young Irish guy working in the system in the UK said, I haven't watched television for three years because I think it just, you know, it just sucks all your energy and it's a distraction and it's not productive to where I want to go. He's a highly ambitious individual. And that was his personal choice to say, I think television is the biggest distractor, therefore I won't, you know, watch it. Um, and then we have this other thing that, of course, is, is so vital, and we've heard Marion speak about it, and, and is this idea of purchasing time. And purchasing time, fundamentally, when you bring somebody into your system, at, it, at its most basic, any type of employment is the purchasing of time. So if you think of an employee or any part, you know, casual labor or a contractor coming in, you're buying their time. It makes sense to use that time really, really effectively. If you think of bringing an employee into your business and you're not very clearly delineating and, and explaining and articulating what they need to do in your business, you're, you're actually wasting money because you're not using the time you just bought. So you're, tro you know, you're, you're flittering that away. So we can purchase time. How do we do that? We purchase time through getting you know, experts in because they're, they, like a contractor is, is, has, the, has the equipment and has the time and they're focused. They're not running off to fix, check the sick cow and to listen to the vet and to do something else. They're focused on just doing that job, making them highly, highly efficient. Um, it could be purchasing time to do things. You know, it could be saying to yourself, oh, you know what's really sapping my time at the moment? It's feeding cattle. You know, just putting feelers out there and saying, well, I know somebody who works in the construction industry. They're not doing anything a huge amount at the moment because X, Y, Z is happening. Maybe the weather is wet and you know that they've got a few hours off. They're not working on site at the moment, but they've got exceptional driving skills. You know, just saying, would you come into my, into my farm and do some, do some feeding for me, for example. So it's just really purchasing time doesn't have to be a huge, I've got to buy the experts in, et cetera. Purchasing time, of course, uh, we've got brilliant examples earlier of, you know, buying things that fit the system. That's purchasing time. Buying smart solutions, buying smart technology, that's purchasing time. So, but if you purchase time, make sure you use the time efficiently. We'd often see that people are doing their own accounts, but they're paying the accountants to sign off on it, you know, things like that. That's, that's a lot of money. Find out, find out what else your accountant can do for you. Find out what else your vet can do for you. And there's always a, a, a bit of a scare around, I would certainly see a big difference between the UK and Ireland, so I think it's chase, changing in Ireland. And um, in the UK, they use their vets far more preemptively, so they get their, their vets in to advise and to consult on how to prevent disease rather than coming in to cure disease. So about being... Um, prescriptive rather than being preventative. I think that's changing a lot in Ireland, but it was something quite quite noticeable when I was working between the two countries originally. Um, so purchasing time, finding out, and equally I would say to you, if you've got somebody in your system that is not contributing to your business, you know, you're using a family friend because they're a family friend, but actually they're not, they're not doing the job properly for you. You know, you have to have the discipline to say no. And to say, I no longer want to be part of that relationship because it's not, in terms of the work relationship, I'm not saying don't be friends with them anymore. Just being able to say, actually, I'm moving my accounts to somebody else. That's really accounts or, or your, your legal business, whatever it is. You, you have to have that discipline because it's, you know, it, you're rewarding poor behavior. If somebody isn't working on your behalf, then you're rewarding them by continuing to pain them. And you're suffering because you're the one at home whinging and complaining that they're not doing the job you hate them to do. So we need to have that bit of discipline we need to set standards, um, but purchasing time is hugely, hugely um, useful. Just make sure you're getting the right people in. Distraction control, find out what they are. Learn to say no by, learn, by understanding what you're protecting. And what's important now, weight your tasks. So you are doing, at any one time, you are doing the task that adds most, most importantly to your business on that day. So um, we will be looking at the, the planner and that that macro view of time and working backwards from there to be more efficient on a daily basis. So I'm sure 
that uh, Marion and, and Stuart have some good questions to come in there. Very good. Thanks, Nolik. Um, just there is one question there on the Q&A. Um, a person says that they're a bit worried about the mindset and that they know nowhere in any industry that um, a business owner has a goal of confining or, contrib or contributing their hours to just to only 40 hours, basically. Is it a kind of a false hope, potentially? Uh, wow. What a great question. Um, I work across all industries and we would certainly find that a lot Oh, I'm going to be controversial here. Um, a lot of the difficulty with confining your hours is that if you built the business, it's your baby. And that, that's very difficult to let go of. It takes a huge amount of confidence to be able to walk away from something that you are so heavily invested in. To some extent, there's an element of vanity involved in it. I am the best and right person to do this job and it couldn't possibly work as well without me. When we look at organizations that are transitioning from... Um, kind of entrepreneurial um, type setup where, you know, there isn't much structure, there isn't much, yeah, there isn't much structure in place. It's often the business owner who's the most disruptive person when you try to structure out the business because um, they don't like that, they feel a bit of control has been taken away from them. And they can be quite, a, it's a funny reference to use, but if, if you think of, if you think of Spider-Man, it's the reason the Green Goblin became the Green Goblin because he was forced out of his, his, his business. Um, but, You've got, you've got to, it, it, you've got to have the, people don't want to do it. That's a great point. People don't want to do it, but you can't not want to do it and then complain you've no time. You can't have both, both sides of the argument. So it's being able to say, I choose to work this hard and not feeling guilty about it. But it's saying, it's being able to say, I choose to work this hard and understanding the consequences of others. And that there's an opportunity cost. If I choose to work this hard and these hours in my business, well, I can't do everything, so something has to let go and deciding what it is that you're going to let go. It is manageable. It just takes a huge amount of discipline. We see that Japan has started to trial the 40-hour week, and it's uh, not the 40-hour week, excuse me, the four-day four week, and they have had any companies that, that's trialed it. They've had huge increases in productivity. Um, we see uh, something else popped into my there now, head there. You, you know, we, we have all these productivities, you know, the four day, the four hour day, all of these different things. When they're done efficiently, it can be done. It just takes a huge amount of discipline to believe in it. And it takes a huge amount of discipline to walk away and to allow it to happen. The only way you can allow it to happen is if you make yourself obsolete. So the ultimate leadership is to become obsolete. That doesn't mean you're useless or not contributing. What it means is you are allowing yourself to be removed from the business without the business collapsing behind you. What does that mean? It could be that you're going to look at expanding. So if you, you know, a threat to any business expanding is if I go and look at the next unit, does the original unit fall apart? If the original unit falls apart, that's because you are toxic to the system. You had the system so centralized that it couldn't survive without you. So ultimately, we need to be able to walk away and leave a productive entity behind us. Uh, Stuart, if I could just come in there, I, I think, Part of that is, you know, I think I just I showed some of the figures that you know some farmers are achieving that, and um, and I'm not saying that it should be a target for any farmer. I suppose my what I was trying to get out of it is that we're trying to create awareness of what people are actually working. So it's being aware, actually, you know, I'm working 80 hours a week. Well, actually, you know, it's actually 40 hours, you know, 60 hours or whatever it is. It's creating that awareness that these are actually the hours that I'm putting into the business. The other aspect is, you know, in terms of working you know the 48 hour working week is 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 in law for employees and it's there because there is research to show um that the more hours you work over 48 your increased likelihood of accidents and um, and health and safety risks and i suppose look farming is notorious in terms of long hours hard work and accidents and, and you know happening on farms so i think it, it's all about creating awareness and consciousness about how how much time we're actually putting into the business. Um, and for me, I think that, that ties back to working efficiently and also managing your time, being conscious about your own time and where you're putting it. Correct answer, yeah, absolutely. Our, our, um, some, I, I think that's interesting that you said that now, Marion, because I was actually, I'm doing another piece there in relation to labor at the moment. And the farmer said to me the other day that it was when they took on the people coming into the business that they had to structure the week in order to fit into the legislation and it actually gave them a huge structure as well so like the, the lads aren't expected to work on a saturday now 
So why okay. should I be working on a Saturday necessarily? Like if there's something to be done, well and good, it may need to be done, but I don't have to always work on the Saturday. No, that's always not that's not always going to be feasible. Obviously, in the owner operator situations, that may not be feasible. But the advantages of a whiteboard and a clock probably to time management would be quite significant, would they? Just even really? like I, I, is a lot of it getting the stuff out of your head now, like and getting it somewhere where you can come back to it. So that you don't forget that you do need to do that. But it, as you said, it's not a priority to get it done now. And a bit like what we were saying before the start, to so that it doesn't become critical, at least you have it written up somewhere that, okay, the, the gap is broken into paddock number 22, and it's yeah. not in three weeks' time when the cows are due to go back in there again that you're above trying to fix it so that you can close them into it before you let them up there like. Yeah, absolutely. It's it's about having, and they're dynamic, they're dynamic task risks. So it doesn't just sit there. It's actually date actioning in that and saying, well, the cows are going out in three weeks time. So that job has to be the latest I can let that leave that job to, and it's going to take X amount of time to do it. So the latest I can leave that job to is X date. So date actioning everything so that it gets done. And um, the minute everything is in your head, you are toxic to your own system. Because if anything happens to you, God forbid, for whatever reason, you, the system stalls because all the information is in your head. So the more we can get the information out of our head, the better. It's also really, really useful um, when you look at lean studies, you know, to, to, wa to watch what people do, and especially on farm, because, you know, I've, I've mentioned this before, if you grew up on farm, you've been farming since you were two. So you've got a huge amount of, uh, of uh, ingrained behavior that isn't necessarily productive. You've done it that way because you've always done it that way. But hey, your farm is completely different to when you were two and when your parents were farming it and had a, a smaller herd size or had different different setup. So what's really useful about writing things down, and I love Marion's example, uh, actually your example, Stuart, about the once I brought people in, they had to structure their day. I, I, it made me reflect on what I'm doing and actually realizing that there could be plenty of redundant behaviors in there that you've carried forward because you've always done them that way. But they're not, they're not conducive to productivity anymore. So it is important to get things out of your head. We write it down because it also stops your head filling up. You know, it's, it's, it's cognitively impairing. It's cognitively stressful to have to contain everything in your head. And if you want to be really fancy, we call writing it down. We call it a visuospatial pad. It's like an external brain. It's an external memory system. And it's a really good thing to have because in my absence, because I had to go to the hospital to get a blood test because something happened to me, work can continue to be done. If you don't get it out of your head and I leave, what can be done? Nobody knows. They don't know where they are. So the minute you can get it out there and use it, it's really important. What I would say to everybody is keep it as easy as possible to access, uh, access that information. Make it as easy as possible for people to do their work. If you've got a task list and I have to take off my boots, take off my overalls, unlock the door, get into the, into the house, uh, switch on the computer, there's a lot of barriers in my way there. I'll just do something for the sake of it. It might not be the right thing, but at least I'm busy. So make it as easy as possible for everybody to do what they should be doing at any one time and share the work that needs to be done because I got my job done really quickly today. Oh, look, there's a nice job I could finish or I could help Marion on her job. So as much as you can, sharing the information about what needs to be done and taking that stress out of you feeling completely tied to your business because it can't run without you. Really, really important. Okay, I think um, we're beginning to encroach into the time thief area now. So I'm just I'm going to finish up by just saying thanks very much to you both for uh, taking part this morning. Uh, excellent as always. Um, as as you've already outlined, Nolig, we're going to talk about the yearly planner, which hopefully will be effective for people for the coming year on the 7th of January when we come back. Um, after Christmas and uh, just to remind you of the other uh, webinars that we're doing so Patrick going and I are doing uh, the final in a, a new entrant type series but it, this one is going to be relevant to all people farmyard infrastructure and building a capital budget so um, anyone that's going doing any project or anything might get value from tuning into that and obviously we have Emma Louise's podcast as well that are out there at the moment um, I forgot to say it at the start, and I'm glad you highlighted Nolly uh, again. Macra Skillnet have been very important to us in having this position or this option available to us um, to have you with us. So thanks to them. And I'm just going to finish with a, a comment from one of the participants this morning. Sorry, have to go now. Just last a half an hour. But on a serious note, it was a very interesting talk. <laughs> There's always a risk that somebody will be smart. There's always a risk. <laughs> Thanks very much to you both.
That's all for this week's Let's Talk Dairy webinar series. And don't forget to look out for more bonus episodes each week. I'll be back with our usual Dairy Edge interview on Monday, so do listen in then. I'm Emma-Louise Coffey, and thanks for listening.